Hi class, uh, this is your professor and I'm recording this because we missed class today and we have a lot to do in this class and I don't want to waste a moment. So I hope you watch this and I hope it's enjoyable and it won't be quite as fun because you won't get to ask questions, but it means that we'll get it done a little more quickly. So today we're talking about professional regulation. And this will impact you if you decide to work as an engineer in British Columbia. So there are three things we're going to talk about today. That is the Engineers and Geoscientists Act, the Code of Ethics, and the Professional Practice Examination. The Act is the first thing. So the Engineers and Geoscientists Act, its purpose is to describe what engineers are required to do and who can be an engineer, who can't be an engineer, and who's allowed to use the term engineer or professional engineer. It sets out the process for becoming a professional engineer, such as the requirements, which were talked about in one of the first lectures um, by Professor Isaacson. And it also gives APIG BC the power to regulate and discipline and this is something that always makes me a little bit afraid, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But before I do, one of the main questions that often comes up is, do I need to register as an engineer? And Professor Isaacson talked about this in the first class. And he, he said the answer is yes, but, and that's essentially true. So under the act, here's the definition of engineering, big, huge, long definition. It basically says, doing anything related to engineering that you went to school or there's a program at school offered for that particular discipline and um, doing that thing. So the answer is yes, you need to be registered with APEG BC if you're doing any kind of engineering. However, APEG BC will probably not go after you if you are not providing your services to the public. So what that means is as long as you are not offering services to the general public, you will probably be okay not being registered as a professional engineer. So for example, um, what if you were just doing engineering for your employer? So I have an example question here. Jane works for Spastics Plastics, a manufacturer of high-end scissors. She designs these plastic bushings that are used in the manufacture of these scissors. The bushings are put in the, the fulcrum point between the two scissor blades so that they glide smoothly. Jane designs the bushings using vector diagrams to calculate loads and then creates drawings of them in AutoCAD. So she's doing engineering. Then those bushings are used in the scissors which are sold to the public. So the question is, does Jane need to register? Well, based on the act, the answer is yes. But in reality, she probably doesn't need to register because APEG BC won't go after her because she's not endangering the public. APEG BC can um, regulate the employer if they are manufacturing faulty products and there's other laws that will um, affect the employer, but Jane herself does not need to be registered because she's working for an employer who's then offering those products to the public. By contrast, if Jane was just making bushings um, and she was just selling those bushings out of her basement, for example, and she was self-employed, or she was selling those bushings to customers who were then making scissors, Jane would need to be registered. And if she wasn't registered, APEG BC would come after her and potentially sue her. And this is what makes me think of APEG BC and the regulators. Uh, a scary man who sort of looks over your shoulder and checks everything that you do. They sort of, they terrify me uh, for a lot of the time. Um, I'm regulated by APEG BC as well as the Law Society in British Columbia. And those are two terrifying organizations for me because they have the power to determine whether or not I can continue to make a living as either an engineer or a lawyer, and they can investigate my practice, they can take away my license, and they can issue me fines. 
And so whenever I think about these organizations, I think of this face scaring me looking over my shoulder. So we talked about the Code of Ethics before, Professor Tagipur did, and uh, he said that it was a set of 10 principles that are required of engineers in BC to, um, to be adhered by. These ethical principles are not only required by APEG BC, but it's also just good practice to follow them. They're just good things to do. If you contravene any of the 10 principles, you can be liable for potentially negligence, meaning a lawsuit, paying fines to APEG BC, um, or you can be liable for uh, your license, so that they could take away your ability to practice. All these things are very serious, so following the code of ethics as an engineer is very important. In here, I've listed all 10 between these two slides, um, and I also have a link at the bottom for where you can find this code. I, I suggest you review the code for two reasons. One is because I'll ask you a question on this, possibly on the quiz, but maybe on the exam. Um, and secondly, you need to know the code in order to do the professional practice examination, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. But you'll notice that the number one thing is that engineers should hold paramount the safety of the public and the health and the welfare of the public and the environment. That is the overriding concern. As Professor Tagipur pointed out, if you have this conflict between, you know, should I do this work for my employer? Uh, my duty to my employer, or should I protect the public? The answer is always you should protect the public. That's always the most important thing. So there's a second set of code of ethics, and this is um, an article that I found a couple of months ago in the engineering magazine. I think the magazine is called Innovate. That's the APEG BC publication that is released on a quarterly basis, or maybe even monthly now and they publish decisions of the various committees that APEG BC um, starts to regulate their engineers. In this case, this was about Greg Saunders. And Greg Saunders, if you recall from uh, the second lecture by Professor Isaacson, was an engineer working on um, the Elliott Lake Mall, which collapsed and killed two people. Greg Saunders was subject to disciplinary action in Ontario, and as a result of that, APEG BC put on additional disciplinary action in BC. Greg in Ontario was charged uh, with fines. I believe he was sued with negligence, and he was also charged criminally with criminal negligence, which the case is ongoing. Um, so he could potentially go to jail for, if you remember, his, his issue was not fully investigating the um, corroding steel beams and, in addition, falsifying uh, a report and not properly checking it over. So the regulatory bodies have a lot of power to affect engineers. That's why following the code of ethics is very important. On Connect, there's an article about this case, and I want everybody to read it so you can see the kinds of things that engineers can get into and what kind of trouble that can cause for them and everybody else around them. It's a very interesting case. So please read that on Connect. Here's another one that was in that same article. Um, this gentleman, Anthony Yam, he lost his authorization to practice engineering. And that was because he was unable to produce various documents when he was in a, being investigated by APEG BC as a part of, I believe it was a, a practice review. He failed to provide documents. So APEG BC said, you need to show us what's going on in your practice. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, sorry. And APEG BC said, well, that's fine. You don't want to show us. Now you're liable for a fine of $5,000. And they would have taken away his license, but instead he just resigned. 
He, he gave up his license voluntarily. So here's another one. This one just came up in the Professional Engineers of Ontario magazine, similar to the APEG BC one, um, where a engineer, an engineer, so-called engineer in Ontario, was advertising his company on social media, LinkedIn, saying he was a professional engineer. Whereas in reality, he was never registered as a professional engineer. Um, PEO didn't take kindly to that, and they fined him with $10,000, and they got a court order saying that he can never use the titles professional engineer or engineer ever again. APEGBC is very restrictive about who gets to use that title. They don't want people misleading the public into thinking that somebody who is not an engineer is an engineer. Uh, here's another one, very embarrassing. Uh, a Richmond Hill, which is I think in Toronto, MP, Member of Parliament, in the election process, he told people that he was an engineer. Uh, he wasn't. I think he was at one point, but he didn't have a license at the time he was going through the election process. And as a result, he had to issue a public apology um, about essentially lying about his credentials. So you can see the start of the letter here. I was elected as an MP, blah, blah, blah. I am not an engineer. I use the titles engineer. I'm sorry for what I did. The, the regulators, they are very careful about these words. And I want you to be aware that you have to be careful about using the words too until you're actually an engineer. So as a student, you can't actually say that you're an engineer um, because you're not. And APEG BC might come after you. They probably won't, but since you're not giving your stuff to the public, they're probably not going to come after you. What you can do if you are registered is call yourself an engineer in training, an EIT. But again, you have to be registered before you do that. So I have another question for you, which doesn't really work because we're on video, but um, my question is this, and this is based on a real case. This client, this client of mine, came into my office recently and asked me this question with slightly different facts because I don't want to reveal who he is. So, you are an experienced, well-known, and respected engineer from South America. You were recruited by Epic Engineering in BC, a large international consulting firm, to work on specialized catalytic reactor design. You love your job, but after about a year into your job, you hear from your buddies back in South America that they want you to size their catalytic reactors. And this excites you because a single contract in this area is worth $50,000, almost half your salary uh, with Epic. The potential clients in South America say to you, um, we don't want to go through the hassle of hiring Epic. We just want to hire you. Can you do it for us? Uh, right now, Epic doesn't work in South America, but they may in the future. But right now they don't. So what do you do? What's the answer? Well, the situation is called moonlighting. And moonlighting is doing another job while you're working for another employer. In a lot of circumstances, you can't do it because there's a conflict that comes up between your duty to your employer and your other work on the side. If you're doing other work on the side that competes with your employer, then you are doing harm to your employer, and that is contrary to the code of ethics and is also going to open, up, uh, open you up to a potential lawsuit. But the question is whether in this case, this working for these clients in South America, where your company is currently not operating, is a, a conflict. Would that conflict with your duties to your company? And in this case, for this client, the answer is probably yes because it's a big international firm. They're doing work all around the world. Just because they're not working in South America right now, they might. And by you taking these contracts, you are potentially depriving business, depriving your company from business that they could have otherwise had. So in the best thing to do in this case is to tell your employer, this is what I want to do. Would you be okay with it? They might be, they might say, we don't want to do any business in South America. Um, but they might say, no, don't do it. And in that case, you would have to listen. Otherwise, like I say, you could open yourself up to um, an employment law issue and also issues with APEG-BC.
So my last point here uh, is that I want to talk about the professional practice examination. Everybody who wants to become a professional engineer in BC must pass this three and a half hour exam. Many of the topics in this class are covered on this exam. Codes of ethics, negligence, contract law. So this class is essentially somewhat in preparation for that exam. It's done on the computer. It's um, mostly multiple choice, but there's also some essay type questions. You can get some sample questions at this link that I put down here. And you can also get uh, previous practice exams through doing some of the, I think you get them through the course materials that you order in order to do this exam. Um, as I say, you must pass it in order to become a professional engineer in BC. So just remember that you can use practice exams and you can find resources on this and practice for it before you write it. Most people pass, especially if they do just some studying for it. So that's the end of this lecture. Um, I just wanted to give a 30 second summary in case you fell asleep. Uh, and that is that, number one, you have to register as a PNG if you're giving service to the public, but probably not if you're um, working for your employer. Number two, if you breach the code of ethics, it can mean fines, restrictions on your practice or stopping you from practicing at all, lawsuits, meaning money that you'll have to pay, or even jail. And finally, uh, this article or this course will help you with the professional practice exam, which is a three and a half hour exam you must pass in order to become a PNG. And the last thing I'll say is, please read that article on the Elliott Lake Mall Collapse because I will probably ask you a question about it. So that's everything for now. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye. See you next time.